Pleasure to have Itai Aynab here from Sydney, who's going to talk about something similar to the title he gave us last week. <laughs> and he changed the desk before the top. Crunchy matter. Yes, it is crunchy matter. But you need to have a You will need headsets. Yeah. So, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to basically give, give the talk. But you know, I only present the speakers, and I'm going to talk, which is really nice for a change. Um, I'm from the University of Sydney, and this is very famous cliffs that we have in South Sydney, as you know. Um, <laughs> well, that was before the global warming. <laughs> uh, I, we will get to that. I'm going to talk about the packing of crunchy matter. And um, there's not a lot of packing. <laughs> It's it, it's um, just a way to connect, but I will make it very light talk. Please interrupt as much as you want, so we can just a fun project, really. Uh, those are the contributors, and I'd like to thank them. Um, essentially, it's a growing community, the Crunchy Matter, and just see all the names in the community. You are welcome to join. That after <laughs> effort of eight years, that's the size of it. Um, we are now split into the dry granular crunchy matter and the wet crunchy matter. We don't talk between our between ourselves, but, you know. So it's, it's it's a real community thing that we are developing. <laughs> no, we we are very happy to work with crunchy matter as you will see. It's a really fun material. Um, so those are the people and whoops. And so you wonder what's crunchy matter, what they call crunchy matter. So, well, granular material may be crunchy if it's brittle internally, uh, but the classical examples would be porous rock, snow, dry snow, uh, egg meringue, and even dry pig ears would be crunchy matter. Okay, that, that would be it. So, um, and, um, Interest for me in this will come from geomechanics. I'm in the world of geomechanics, and uh, one of the uh, things that I'm bothered with are localization processes and bifurcation processes in geomaterial. And we can see here, oops, I don't want to do that. We can, you can see here sets of um, orthogonal bands. They are actually, geologists tell us that they are actually coming normal to the major principle stress. Um, and um, they happen in geological time scales and geological stresses. So that might, might be something in Sydney. We have a lot of uh, sandstone, which is a crunchy matter for me. Um, and in those bands, you could really see grain crushing. So those bands have been, are having lower porosity than the neighboring uh, rock. And, and a lot of uh, classic materials, so the grains are crushed under pressure. And the problem of, of, of doing uh, of such a material in the lab is that you can't replicate the time scale behind what we see here, and neither the uh, uh, and also not the stress levels, right? It would be very hard to achieve that. Yes. So, so this is an eruption, just by the way. Of, there are many processes out there that. Won't happen on the time scales, even if you can do a laboratory astrophysical phenomena. So you can basically, you basically, this is a laboratory for a billion years or hundreds of billion years. That's right. So, what we are seeing here, and, and I would I would continue with, with that line. So, what we're seeing is just a snapshot in time. And we might see something that is currently being loaded in a very slow rate. So, um, and I don't have patience, or unfortunately, you know, still, I'm not yet there. Uh, um a robot to live forever it might happen so instead of that the idea um would be to you could do that in, in, in experiments and you would get stresses to the 90 mpa i don't have in the lab uh, such well we do have but going to stresses that are in the gigapascal is becoming a problem and in particular i don't have the patient to load it as slow as geology right so we are here facing um, with the reality and want to face um, with that reality, we are using rice bubbles or rice crispies. 
Okay, so we're going to take a pack of rice crispy and load it much faster. It's a much more brittle material, so we can easily get compaction in much lower stresses, um, 50 kPa, much lower stresses, and very fast. So that's the idea. That, that's the recipe of today's talk. Okay, we're going to focus. This is going to be our focus material. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. There only be rice crispy, so don't worry. So my students told me when I told them that my nickname is the third derivative, which probably yes, yes, the snap crackle and so 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 that's the other question of series. So you have you'll see snap crackle and bubble. So so the higher derivatives really come in and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> definitely. And we can see the snap crackle pop, right? That's in the ad of uh and there's a lot of that. You could actually see snap crackle pop in the stress time plot in the top. That's what it is. This is now we are marching in time. We are looking at a pack of rice krispies. The piston goes in constant velocity from the top that we control in various experiments. And if you kind of blink your eyes carefully, you might start seeing that the pattern side of the pack is stationary. Well, and then it, it propag there is a propagation upwards of the front, where at the, at the very top it moves with the piston, then there is a front which is this kind of compaction front, it's a bend, which separate the packs. And you can actually do image uh, correlation, PAV, post-venture, particle image for uh, velocimetry, and collapse everything to one dimension, so you ignore that dimension. And what we see here, uh, those contours would be in terms of the velocity, so dark will be no motion, and uh, white would be the motion of the piston. So initially, there is this kind of very chaotic um, phase. And after some time, about here, things start to get organized, and you get that recurrent compaction front that basically goes up, sometimes goes down, but generally, this experiment goes up, especially at the end, going from the bottom up. And you can listen to it just a second. Is one of the axes the, the force here? The control is the stress rate, the force right. over the area. Okay. Um, can you hear actually? Yeah. So if you listen carefully, every time the blue cursor goes to the top, you'll hear this kind of pack. Listen. So it's when the band is actually reaching the top. It emits more sound, which is cool. Um, so we want to describe that process and understand it better. Um, one thing I want to say is this, just generally our thought of why that happens, that there is this kind of chaotic phase followed by an organized phase. So initially you can think about it, there is friction taken from the side, not a specific phenomenon what you see occurring. We now understand it's not six phenomena, so don't think about that. But there is definitely higher stress at the top than the bottom. So actually, the stress here is the stress at the top piston. If I measure it from the bottom, you pretty much have similar line, but just with a lower value. So you'll have two lines, okay, and, and not in this particular experiment. And um, what happens is that the stress here at the top is higher and the bottom is lower. There is the Janssen sort of effect, exponential decay of the stress. Um, and, 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 and at the top, it's, it's consolidated faster, right? You have more crushing, more core collapse. So the material in a macroscopic sense, in a homogeneous sense, becomes stronger. It has a higher stress and gradually it's becoming also stronger. And at some stage, the stress over the strength of the material becomes fairly homogeneous. Although the stress is not homogeneous, the stress of the strength over time gradually picks up this homogeneity, and that's where things start to get this organized uh, behavior. Okay? Quick question. What happens to the air? Is it easily able to... Yes, yes. We... This, yeah. Of course. But, and, and, and the plate allows the air to go out. Of course, there is a time scale to the air. We will get to that. That brings some viscosity into the system. If you um, the whole thing more slowly, you get the same curve. We'll get to that. All good questions. 
And this is the first test we've done. You can also see that, in fact, you can identify that this is bent, where the deformation, uh, this is the strain rate in this particular case. And you could see that, for, that the, the bend is at the top, then it's traveling up. So you see the time here. When it reached to the top, it's re emerged in the bottom, goes up, re emerged from the bottom, and that's basically the deformation rate. Okay, deformation gradient. It happens on a on a length scale, which is unfortunately the grains are crushed. So the, to talk about the size of the grain would be ridiculous because they crashed anyway. But it's uh, definitely more than a couple of you know micropores within the particles. If that that gives you a hint about the size. Okay, so we tried to reason that. So the first idea was let's think about the Russian doll. This is actually us cutting the rice barrels and making a nice photo. <laughs> um, and you see that you have within a single grain, you have pores, and within pores, you might have more pores, and so on and so on. So you might think about kind of a fractal geometry there of a Russian doll. So you have a you know object within object within object. And if you now take that into the wall or into a bull, you'll first break the big pores, and that then a vacate the new Russian doll. So this is gone, and now I'm going to touch this Russian doll. Then maybe that propagates. This is a geometrical type of model, and it's hard to connect it um, to the rate and to things like that. So we moved on to a little bit more uh, mechanistic model. So this would be model two. Very simple lattice uh, lattice screen model where. You see, this is our model, basically, a very discrete wall of the rice crispy. Um, smooth boundaries here, and we apply constant velocity as a top. There's many springs in each direction. So there's lump masses here. So it's really like the discrete element method that we've heard a lot, but just that the contact between uh, the nodes here is characterized by what we imagine would be the typical behavior of, let's say, one, one drain or a typical collection of grains. So if this is the length of the spring, what we are saying in this very simple starting point model is that we have elastic response initially, linear elastic response, spring is shortened, until we reach a critical breakage force, then we lose the force, pieces of shatters, we, the piston doesn't feel anything. And then we need to reconsolidate the piston further. And we get, again, we assume very simple elasticity. The change, the, the, this is basically almost constant, the spring. But we are making this, this we keep strengthening. So um, that's the one thing. Now, apart from that, if you ask about viscosity, um, we are having a global damping that could be mimicking the resistance from the air. That's one thing. We also remove that. We need a form of dissipation. So one of this would be a damping. Uh, this is global damping in this particular case. We also play with local damping. So when you have two uh, nodes getting closer, there is relative motions. You can add damping there. So this is a different model that you've not here. And then another uh, model is that we're thinking about those masses because it's it's a two-dimensional sort of quasi-two-dimensional problem. You can imagine the masses getting resistive frictional force from the boundary, and so we can act either of these um, ideas. Good question about that. You mentioned it's two-dimensional model. I might have said it's a one-dimensional model. It's a one-dimensional model. One why not one-dimensional? You have 20 things across. Yeah, it's a very good question. So when we run that model as one bit, we cannot replicate it, mm. which is fascinating. Yeah, that is interesting. Uh, we even, when you take our model and you do periodic in this direction, that, you don't get it. So you need sort of, the, in this particular model. But if one... But, and if one link breaks uh, this okay. node to the neighbors and to the entire level, it, it, yeah. it looks like one dimensional. It looks like one dimensional, but if you if you put periodic boundaries or if you just do the model like that, we can't get those. The wall fiction that really brings in the two D or the three D aspect. Of um, I, I think there is always some um, noise in the system. 
and that allows you to see, right? Which you wouldn't see in a one dimensional model. Mm. But for some reason, which is for discussion, I really don't, this has always puzzled me. This day. When you put the periodic boundary, it kills our ability to capture it. But we'll get to model three. In model three, it's a continuum model that I didn't actually put much emphasis about that. I just mentioned it now because we'll, we can continue this discussion when I get to the continuum. And the continuum is in tensor space, okay, stress strain in tensor. We are able to replicate the phenomena in a one bit way, but there is a tensor that takes that sort of this dimensionality. So maybe it's one, you need one and a half. D would be my maybe something like the Poisson ratio of the two D material versus the yeah, D material because you get that in yeah because here it's fixed by the lattice yeah uh, if I have only one D I don't have Poisson ratio mm -hmm. I need that ability to translate laterally but yeah that could be further investigated I don't really hundred percent sure in the, in the answer to that um, another thing you, you, so here is one experiment in one velocity. You ask about someone asks about what if I if I do it faster or slow. Maybe that's close to what we saw before in the movie, right? You see how nicely everything goes up. In the experiment, we saw actually also going down a little bit. Uh, most of the experiments are up, upwards propagation, but from time to time we, we run the same experiments and it will be downward propagation. And sometimes it's up, down, up, down, up, down. It's a very chaotic system. It's it's a bifurcation phenomenon, right? But I just show you what we see in most of the experiments. In most of the simulation, which is also a little bit, if I change a little bit the node positions, you can actually trigger different mechanisms. It goes top, uh, up, down, up, down here. Um, if we play with velocity, uh, we have two, two regime in very fast velocities. We, we have sort of a diffuse breakage. So everywhere is breaking. All the time, it almost looks like elastic response, but there's breakage all the time. Okay, everything just is diffused across. At the top, we have something uh, erratic regime, and this is an oscillatory regime. Um, we know we can coarse grain the numbers of events that the spring undergoes. And what you see here is kind of, we call that the breakage rate. We can do it over a unit of time, so you can actually see how many times a string has gone through collapse. And of course, the velocity that you saw before diagram is a compare. You can see it, it is, you could see the bend where the action happens. So that happens about a, a few springs, and you, you, you get the sense of uh, the numbers of breakage events in per unit time. Um, right, this is a diffuse, so breakage is everywhere, homogeneously almost. And this is erratic, it's hard for us. We could not do any spatial. We could not do any correlation to find any, 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 any sense of the top, so we call it erratic. So those are three regimes. Fascinatingly, we have seen sometimes concurrently two bands traveling and even three bands traveling in the model. In experiments, we have seen a few evidence for two bands propagating like that. So that means if you have a two, this is stationary, this is moving with the first piston, and there is some inter intermediate velocity. Um, you can do the, we know all the, of course, we have in this model, we know the mass, we know the viscosity, we know the, the breakage force that we were, at least the first one we, we, we talked about, so we can define three different times. Uh, typical time for breakage, so that's basically the macroscopic strain rate, V over H, will be macroscopic strain rate, and F over KL um, would be the time it gets, sorry, the, the, it would be the amount of deformation required in order to reach the first breakage event. So that gives us a typical breakage time. This is a typical elastic time, nothing special, it relates to the mass and the spring stiffness and the length of the string. Uh, we have a viscous time. So ratios of three times, we can get two dimensionless group. Um, and we plot them here. So this will be like the breakage, this visco breakage viscosity time or number, and this will be break or, break or elastic number, whatever you want to call that, right? So those are the dimensions number. And we can run heaps of simulations and define like, what we see. So um, 
Yeah, I mean, in uh, as we saw before, in high velocities, um, we are high velocities. We are diffused. In low velocity, we are maybe erratic, and somewhere in between, we have this uh, oscillatory regime, which one band, two bands, and three bands according to the breakage time and uh, the elastic time. Okay, so. As I said, we can have local damping or friction with wall, or we can even activate everything together and introduce their own dimensionless units. Okay, but we so uh, you can get those various regimes in, in all those models. Um, Isn't the container size a uh, parameter that at the time a sound wave would travel through the container so that information goes through? It's, it's the container, yeah. it's H, the capital H is the height. And we're using the initial height, mm -hmm. of course it changes and we just report here based on the initial values of, that we see in this diagram. But those things, those numbers are not constant, unfortunately. But there would be the lateral traveling and the vertical traveling? The lateral didn't affect. Yeah, yeah, okay. no, yeah. Then back to the question we had before, right? Mm. So, yeah. The part of that, but not the, the, the H, the, this, this control. Um, yeah, and so you might ask yourself, what happens if we roughen the wall? Right? We go in this, we increase our friction coefficient. This is in this model. We would expect that for maybe oscillatory or diffuse regime, we will gradually go into erratic regime. So, in fact, our first test we've done that in, in the first paper. We roughen the walls and you got basically this in the experiment, which is really nice. So this was a very simple model. But for me, not yet satisfactory as an engineer. I'm an engineer, probably the only engineer here. Are there any engineers here? Okay, I'm good. <laughs> Rob, are you an engineer? I triple in. Wow, <laughs> that doesn't matter. Solo engineer. <laughs> and definitely get into minority here. Um, so, yeah, so as, as an engineer, I really want to end up with a product which is at the end of the name differential equation I can put in the computer and have fast solutions, right? So that's where my current PhD student, David, uh, has been working. I'm not going to show you too much of the details of the model. It's a continuum for series equations which has basically two temperature and mesoscopic temperature that what you see, it doesn't matter for us. It's the whole class of crunchy matter. It could be grains, it could be foam. Brittle foam. What we are saying is that the moment there is a certain plasticity or a crushing event, it triggers an avalanche inside of fluctuating velocities that could give you a mesoscopic type of temperature. And so we have uh, the hydrodynamic equation for that. That temperature, we have the equation, and that temperature basically decays into the astomistic level within the material. And we have a uh, the state variable will be the density or the solid fraction, the elastic strain and those two temperatures, basically. And I'm not showing you the details of that model. Um, it produces very similar response. This is a continuum model that generates clicks by itself. Um, because of this uh, competition, of, because the, the, the energy decay, every time you reach to a certain level, then you trigger an event and the energy then decay downward. And it produced those so to response in a considered fashion. So we put it in a very meticulously into finite element very carefully. There is diffusion of the, the mesoscopic temperature that give you a landscape and regularized stuff. I don't want to get into much of that. And we can actually pick it up in a continuum sense. So we have a crunchy continuum, basically. And you can do almost the same thing as the spring lattice model. But um, now I was not satisfied. I said, you know, until now it cost only five dollars less, right? Per experiment. So I contacted my good friend Christoph Godin, who is an uh, important man that runs centrifuge. <laughs> I went to the centrifuge. This is a piece of machine of ten million dollars, <laughs> and we put the rice bubbles. They, they cleared out all the daily projects. There was about fifty thousand dollar a day business type of thing, right? They pushed them aside and we put the rice crispies 
I mean, that maybe we'll find something interesting, but when you run it in the centrifuge, you, you pretty much get the same phenomena. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, and you can put the gradient of the gravity if it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Why did the, um, do you see like the, the, Sides of each of those exactly. Yeah. Ah, this one. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is I, I I didn't mention at all until now. I was showing you similar plot which was spatial temporal. So they were at, uh, we we do PAV. This is the lazy approach. We didn't really do the science. So the lazy approach you do image subtraction, and there is a flickering of the light. So I don't I I don't think there's any significant for for that lines and stripes. But it's just. The lazy approach of seeing the same thing. Yeah, my, my question was in the first thing, all your tweaks build up and then there's a sudden drop. Yeah. Deeper? Yeah. Yeah, there is a change in the direction oh. of the band. So that's what I was saying. And in fact, even in 1G, if you run it twice, you might one time go to the band up and the second time. Kellogg's has also not made, sorry, I, I revealed the brand. No, no, it was Kellogg's. Just to be clear that in the second one, if I read it from left to right, it says there's a further increase and then it comes yeah. down again. Uh, yeah, there is a bit of a, a top a up down. That's what I'm saying in simulation. We see it like that. This is more consistent. For example, you get up and down, band goes up. Is that what you're referring to? Are you saying that if I look at your first images, most of them look like there's a ramping upwards, upwards. and then a sudden drop. Yeah. In your true. second images, it looks like there's a it's exactly the opposite. Jump and then it's it's exactly the opposite. So that that is that's exactly what um, it, we also saw it between simulation and and experiment before. And even it, as I said, even if you run the same experiment twice, just different pack, um, it's it's a very bifurcation like phenomena so sometimes what you see is again you have the path you compress it you have that top layer goes down the bottom layer is pretty much inert and the, and, and the boundary between them might either go up and when it reaches the top re-image from the bottom and go up re-image from the bottom and go up that's what we saw in the experiment before <laughs> sometimes you get exactly the opposite it starts from the top goes down and when it reaches the bottom, reimage from the top. So those are the two. And sometimes it goes this. Okay. Okay. Meaning you see left, right, left, right, and uh, yeah. And that's exactly what that that is. This is a, a bottom up, bottom up. This is a top down sort of propagation. It was in an individual trial. You see. Yeah. Sometimes you 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 see it's coordinated, and all of a sudden you decide to go back and forth. Uh, but but the same pack, if I, no, not the same pack, but I open two packs and run them in exactly the same condition. One might do the downwards propagation, the other one the, the bottom up propagation. Most of the time in the experiment, it goes bottom up. Most of the, I'd say 80% or more of the, the cases. It's a totally different question than about the brand it shows, but you may have an agreement, exclusive agreement with that company. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you showed the rice crystals, I thought about the load on the pathway surface that I saw this morning. And it's made from clinkers or the, the, the residue from the coal fired pot plant in the past. Mm -hmm. And I also think about visiting places that have volcanic. Uh, mm -hmm. We see that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. I get to that. We'll get there. We'll okay. get to other materials, but unfortunately, not for that particular test because you just you require. We have done it actually on that story. We have done it, but it's just the threat level is so much higher. And the container you need to probably suffer a window instead of like the last door. Yeah. So, but I believe it's the same thing. I mean, yes. Um, and here's other material. Listen to the sound. So this is my friend Adrian McCallum. He's been studying in Antarctica and pushing CPTs mm -hmm. in geomechanics world. And I asked him, I don't know if it's true, that must these clinks are must be from the machinery or something. He said, no, 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 it's from the ice. I still think it's, it's weird. But you can see the kind of jumpiness of this. And it, 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 if you go skiing, you also see that you have compaction band in the pods, right? So remember that. Just remember that. And now, done. 
Uh, after our paper, the same test was done by ice, by hot on snow, and you could see similar thing in snow compaction. So here's one more material that happens. Um, what's nice about ice or snow, they have sort of strained sensitivity. So if you try to characterize the microscopic strength of uh, snow, dry snow, as a function of the strain rate, um, you would see that it hardens up to a point and then it's weakened. And so this is something which is weird, which is called strain rate sensitivity. And when you see strain rate sensitivity, when the material becomes weaker as, you, you be, as you're loading faster, you tend to, to see this type of localization phenomena. And we see them also in metallic alloys. Uh, this is what's called PLC effect. Uh, for the, I, I don't want to say it, and maybe you can help me. Thank you. I don't want to abuse uh, the important person. <laughs> <laughs> and what they're associated with is the strain rate adding followed by softening. And you see here the strain rate, here's the force in this particular case. And you get that kind of hysteresis that the material cannot support itself. When it, it, it hardens over the rate, we increase the rate, and at some stage it can't support itself because of the softening. So it jumps here and you get this kind of hysteretic loop, which explains those up down acceleration in the stress strain. So we is went. That, is that a tensile or compression? Uh, that is tensile. In snow, you can find that in shear in other materials and compression in. But the general, so we're not looking at the direction so much, but in this particular case, it's indeed tensile. Um, yeah. And so we've done that in compression on the right Swiss piece, it's a bit more messy. So you see the strain rate, um, or why we treat it as velocity? I'm not sure, but this is millimeter per second. Yeah, yeah, this velocity, sorry. So there's a piece on velocity. So for example, let's look at the red. We are having 0 0.1 velocity, then we slow down and it gets stronger, the material, right? You slow down 10 times and it goes up. Then here you accelerate, it goes back to the same sort of imaginary line that we have here, as if nothing happened. Then we keep accelerating and it goes down. Uh, you can actually organize that by the velocities here. And so indeed you have kind of a softening followed by a hardening. Um, I, this is a macroscopic type of averaging of the, um, of the picture. I don't quite think that we should, because in the material, none of the assumptions in our spring lattice model, we don't have anything that depends in the material strength. On the, on the rate. And so for me, this is a, what we are saying in this paper, that this is actually an emerging phenomenon. It's not the material ingredient. It's not the physical uh, um, building block of the material, of course, because it, we didn't put that. And we pick it up in the simulation. This is in a very different, di this is different um, viscosity. So that's low viscosity, high viscosity. So in low viscosity, you really see uh, the strength going down and then up. And you could see the type of compactions that, or the, the type of deformation. Fascinatingly, what I show you until now, I think belongs to this side. And you actually don't see strain rate softening, yet you see all those phenomena. But just again, to show that while you do see strain rate softening, even metallic alloys and snow, you don't need that. It's not in something you want to put in an ingredient. As I showed you the continuum model, we don't actually have that type of thing. And we're able to pick up uh, all those fascinating uh, classes of uh, phenomena, right? You don't need, though, to feed in so that it's like that. That's sort of what people do, which I don't think is necessary. Um, now, just to a bit of a, a pride that I get. Although I didn't win the Ig Nobel Prize, but uh, Randall Monroe uh, did pick up on this paper and they say that, you know, if, 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 if you get a cartoon from Randall Monroe, you've made it in science. So I'm very proud. Uh, <laughs>
And I don't know if you want to use that in America, in the New York Times, but good luck if you want to use Rice Krispies. But that's the idea that they had in New York Times. I was looking for a snack. Here. <laughs> so, of course, you might wonder what happened when crunchy matter interact with fluid. So we moved to the wet community. And I don't talk with the guys in the dry community. So myself in the wet community have no discussion with <laughs> anyway. Uh, a nerdy joke that no one understood. Okay. In a, in a class of nerds. I, I don't know. So I'm really an <laughs> ultra nerd. <laughs> so, but back to my engineering discipline, triggered by embankment dams and talking to a very famous professor in the geo world. And I, I became aware of uh, a problem that happens in rock field dams. They are like the material you talk about that you see when you're bike, in the bike ride, right? So those are filled with rocks that are porous. And there is rivers underneath with seepage upwards. And what they see is that the, the measure, the dam goes through recurrent collapses, right? So we said, okay, why don't we just put milk in? <laughs> our experiment. So we have a reservoir, ski mills, I should say, and we didn't do it in the, yeah, and we did it also with water, but ski milk never, I don't want to get fat, you know, so it just, so you have your reservoir, we just fill like a fixed amount of, uh, of liquid here, and we put constant pressure at the top, and we're just going to wait and see what happens. And that's the whole experiment. Just plug in a fixed amount of, um, of liquid, and see what happens. Um, it's actually you poured it at the top. You could have poured the cereal in. Well, no, we pour it. Yeah, we didn't do that. Sorry to disappoint. We are putting it from underneath. We're trying to be a little bit more scientific. At the top, the top was dry and stuff. It's yeah, the yeah, dry. yeah. So you can actually see that. Before I play that. This is the sea milk and accelerated 10 times from real time. Okay. A little bit of bubbles and it's mucky and everything. Um, you see the interface of the milk and the particles and the crunchy matter. Um, so what happened is that initially we are under the fixed load. We try to, we have a servo. We try to keep the servo, but once you put the milk, it just runs and the servo tries to Pick it up so there is an initial decay of the stress and so you could notice the scale it doesn't start from zero but the server cannot pick up after but then it goes up and then you see those quakes at the top so you see that the, every now and then the stress just bang falls down and you can actually see it here so the material sits and keep crashing into the mill here All right look at it boom and that continues forever. And this is for those that like discrete time. You could really use that to wind your clock, but it will be a very uh, damping or damp. It's almost like a damp metronome. And I'll, I'll, I'll play the sound of that. I don't know if you can hear well. It, it, it's actually. This is not the real, the sound in the lab is so strong. It's actually the first time I heard it was a surprise, it was a shock. The whole lab was, was bursting from, you know, it was really making loud sounds. Every click like this is when you actually collapse and makes really big sound, right? Okay, um, and you see that the distance between the collapses keeps elongating over time. So the question is why? How are we doing with time? Yeah, okay. Right, so here is our pictures. What we can take is a line of pic pixels and plot it over time. So what you see is how everything consolidates downwards. We have this uh, area where the milk is. You see those blips here. This is when we have the collapses, the quakes, call them rice quakes. And in between, you have the creep phase. So actually, this goes downward in a creeping mode. So you have a creep quake cycle, with cyclical collapse in this material. Um, and we try to understand it with a simple model. So you ask for TAF. So yes, 
we could not do in a hydrology or the water retention to understand the section saturation of these materials. So here's the saturation. Here is uh, the sort of uh, how, how it goes in depth. This is from other experiments. You cannot do it on rice species because they will mash and you will not be able to. So we look at the at geotechnical rice species, which is this stuff, and you could actually connect it to a capillary length. This to do with the surface tension. This is the micropore size, gravity, and density. So that's a typical length that characterizes that profile between saturation and, and uh, depth. So what we are imagining now is the material basically consolidating into this profile. And so we developed a model based on that profile of saturation that have these heritages of masses that have a length scale associated with them. If the length scale will be the pore size of within the particle there's pores that we saw before in the cross section. And then we can imagine stiffness that degrades over uh, this kind of a damage type of model of stiffness that as a uh, material is being absorbed, the milk is being absorbed by, or the rice crispy rice bubble absorbed in milk, it is weakened, it becomes smudgy. And so we are basically having a damage variable here. So you have, if this is my uh, spring length and stress, I get, keep degrading and bringing down my strength. And when my strength reaches the stress I apply because I'm under constant stress, I go through a crushing phase um, that basically I jump to a new state that everything collapses, right? So this is our model, very simple model. And at this stage, this happens due to the um, gradual activations of the cell. There's a lot of chemistry here that I don't understand. That, that, that basically you have the creep phase and the crushing phase, the quake phase. Uh, just to, if you can easily take and do mathematically, you can sum up uh, along all the springs over time, you can sum up the length in the, the you can have crushed that are getting crushed springs. Those are already fixed at that length and they are going to stay here in the model forever. So you sum them all up. And then you are summing up all the springs that are in this phase, and you know over time where they would be. So that gives you uh, the uncrushed set of uh, springs, and you can just sum them up. Um, and this is a discrete model, so you can continuumize it, and you can make the time continuous from instead of uh, discontinuous. I'm telling you, this is the model for everything. Yeah. This is the quantum gravity there, all there. Um, and then, it, yeah, you can, you, it has a nice limit, continuous limit that you can um, find the creep uh, parameters and you can compare now experiments to model. So yeah, there's simplified numeric analytic, you can do everything analytically. There is which approximate the numerical and you have what, two analytical one. And the smoothened one is the one that is in the continuum limit. So they all sort of go together, and you should really see the creep quakes. So those are, are, are quakes followed by creep quakes, quakes, and so on. Um, you can validate it or try to. So you, you can plot here the time between the drops versus the time. As I said, it's like a damped uh, metronome. You can almost wind your clock with this. It's just incredible how. It continues, and the model tells us that everything is, is about this number, non-dimensional number. Um, so we could, so the model is best fitted with a, a, a pore length of 0 0.6. Um, and we went in here and measured the pore size very roughly. This is the histogram of the pore sizes inside of about a number of those particles happen to be about roughly the same place. Um, then you might ask, what about other material? So you can start doing the same thing in ice by applying heat or transmit water in salt or put acid in carbonate sand. So I have another, a very nice student, Leo. He's from the wet community. He doesn't talk with David from the dry community. He's actually a very good friend, but... <laughs> 
And you, you just see the same thing in all of this material. So the key point is that you need to have a gradient field that weakens this crunchy matter, and then it just it just happens. So it's almost like a recipe for this creep quake collapse. So you might wonder why Antarctica in my first slide, so we're getting to the end. Um, so under Antarctica's ice, there is one of the interesting things is Lake Williams, and you basically have water and melt water that is actually seeping up, right? And you get twice daily and the rice quake, sorry, ice quake, <laughs> sorry, you get it right, rice quake, twice daily in uh, the magnitude is seven in Richter scale, just that you can, we just don't feel it because it's a different wavelength. But that amount of energy is being released from this. That, that coupled with the tidal, uh, so twice a day. So I no, I actually think it is coupled to this model. That's it, and and I will show you now. I spent a couple. I mean, I understand what you're saying. Phase. No, it's not phase because this is you could. I don't think so. But it's the twice a day. Yeah, it is twice a day. But um, it's a good question that could be should be from, but it, it's from remembering the papers they report this. It's not, and they don't know exactly what it is. They're looking for mechanisms. So the mechanism they're trying is fix it. But we are saying that it might be actually some form of that sort. And you see slowdown that we actually saw in the rice krispies. Um, so we made the side comments in our paper. Um, and we got that from the time. <laughs> right? they, they so I was really happy because I'm saving the world for the second time. The first time it was saving cars, you know, so you should thank right. me for that. Second time, we, we, we solved the sinkhole problem, apparently, according to this uh, paper. But the best quote I got from journalists is from their reputable HK 101. Right? You know that one. You know the times. And you know, HK101, these people have a lot of time to read things, so they wrote the following. Aussie scientists saving the world's ice shelves from collapsing using rice bubble. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt very happy to have done that. So, okay, so final words. Uh, you can save the world using $5 worth of material, but you need the $10 million centrifuge uh, and test it in hypergravity. Um, you know, when compressed, even that they are randomly packed, uh, the media, because they crash, they create these organized patterns, like these oscillatory patterns. And there's many other compaction patterns. And when you wet it, you can easily unpack the packed media. So don't forget that. So you live in a very theoretical world. <laughs> this is the practice, and that happens. And um, yeah, that produces this quick quake collapse. So. Um, that's all I have to say, and uh, thanks for the question in the middle, please continue. Hey. I can understand that snow is crunchy, a little bit like rice krispies, but uh, ice is pretty compact already, so what is the similarity between rice krispies and ice? Ice is not compact. Snow is definitely not compact. No, not the ice. Not compact. You would think, but there's a lot of force. But mm -hmm. but the in you know we are talking now on Antarctica. Okay. So the ice is there. Is, there were two ice, right? There was the dry snow that's mm -hmm. definitely porous, almost uh, with a very very uh, low solid because you know you have all those ice crystals and they create structures which is super porous. So mm -hmm. this is for snow. That we saw by a different route. The glaciers are crushed snow. Yeah, and glaciers are crushed snow and they're not packed to. Okay, so they can okay, even some yeah, more. Yeah, there is a porosity or solid fraction of 90%. There's still four networks. But even the uh, ice in your freezer, the white ice has air in it. Oh, it's yeah. quite a bit less dense than clear ice. Mm -hmm. It costs more money. Yeah. But, but is, is the base of the, the ice caps also because it's warming and it's, it's melting a little bit? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's also probably hollowed out. And that, that, that connects to the test we have, yeah, which will open new. Of course, this is a very simple model that we keep the pores the same, but that's exactly what we did here. So we actually picking up on the button 
that that would be the entire experiment if you want to. Hasn't been part of this is new thing. Yeah, but and the transport of air through this ice, which still has pores, presumably more difficult than through the rice crispies. So, let, let's yeah, so there's one thing to mention. So here is which I think, yeah, I need to just clarify again. The gradient is the heat flux. That's what we put in that type of understanding. So you might even have zero porosity, it's fine. What you need is a flux which, with a gradient. And so you, you would imagine that, that at the base there is melt water, right? And the, the heat goes up and you're losing the heat with that, right? And that means that you are hitting you are hitting here much faster than over here. So at the bottom you're hitting faster than at the top, and that's very similar to the Rice Krispie experiment. But the field is different. So here on the y-axis in, in this one, you just change the different field. And the ingredient, the recipe, is you just need the field with a certain gradient. That may be the saturation. That's what we got stuck on. But actually, maybe in Antarctica, more relevant is the, the heat okay. field. Mm -hmm. is having a uh, distribution, okay? Mm -hmm. And then it's the same phenomenon. When you have the difference between ice and water, which also plays... This is second law, or this might add another thing, but I don't think it's the required, right? I mean, when you want to develop a comprehensive model, absolutely, we need to consider it. But for, we just want to understand the phenomenon. Okay. But that allows for water vapor. It's a water vapor, <laughs> liquid water, ice vapor. Yeah, the temperature is probably about 10 degrees centigrade at the base. It's the temperature of the Earth's crust. Yeah. Mild down. Okay, can I ask you this? I was, was going to ask this sort of facetiously earlier, but given Oppenheimer the film, and you know, a lot of the, the underground nuclear testing now is done in places where they, they probably look at this stuff that under, I don't know how many, you know, once after Terra. Uh, Adam Pascal. Mm -hmm. I was wondering again whether whether um, folks who, you know, they probably don't go in and look, but uh, mm -hmm. go off. I think, yeah, I think that in such pressures, many other things happen yeah. that are even more important, right? You start melting in that phase, change the other direction. Yeah, there's big of course. But I think not not right after, but far in from the right. Where the actual detonation is probably also the Well, yeah, when you have meteorite, you, you go and you, when you go in meteorite, you would, well, first of all, you see melts, so you see what's called pseudo like light, which are those rocks that have been molten. Uh, but if you go under and you look at the cross section, you do see such compaction, frozen compaction. So, so I guess the, the question is whether you would see in the same way that you saw in mean, one of your earlier pictures with these perpendicular to the strut directions, yeah. when you see sort of frozen in time. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's, what what you see. Yeah, that's exactly what you see under meteorite uh, impacts. Yeah. For so example. You, you, get, you get sort of a, a very long time version of your experiment frozen in time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you picked it up on the first slide. Actually, I used to have another slide, but I removed it about the Bohr number. Are you familiar with the Bohr number? B O H R or B O R E. The Bohr is the Bohr Bohr in uh, from the Hebrew uh, from the Bible. Oh, Bohr number. Debra, you said Debra. Uh, it's Bohr. Uh, now I know what to say. Okay, it's written in the Bible and read it in Hebrew. <laughs> No, so this number is the, the time of the time of the, time of the, the formation. Time of the Lord. Yeah, exactly. This is exactly the, the quote. I can say it in Hebrew, it won't help. You see that that's what happened with my Hebrew. I need to talk to my Hebrew. Okay. So this is uh, it says, so God has this infinite time of observation. So everything is flowing in the eyes of God. So you have this number, which is the time of the formation of the time of observation. So PhD student have three years or four years in, in US, right? And, but if, he had, if that student have, you know, 100 years, maybe he would observe the thing. So you're looking at when that number is about one, and then you call that thing fluid. Uh, if it's below it, so, 
it's all about the so we see frozen in time and we think it's solid, but actually in the in the eyes of the Lord, it's actually you know flowing. This is why the motto of the well, I call it the American Society of Theology is pattering everything flows. Yeah, everything flows. Yeah, exactly. Which comes from Rhino, which is indeed from, from the technique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The uh, when the rice krispies break, do they keep their outer shape and it kind of cr crushes, or do they break into little pieces? Um, it's both. <laughs> it's very complex uh, structure. So sometimes they split into pieces that you can identify, like into two or whatever, but they crush into themselves. Not like little sponges that squish down. We do a bit of that, but when you take it out, you see also lots and lots of powders. And we saw in the experiment powders at the base, so you okay. def you, you, you definitely those are fragments that it's brittle, it's crunchy. Yes, yeah. and then you're after peta. I think Ada is ten minus twenty. Yeah, I need to go the other. Yeah, thanks. I just couldn't remember it. Yeah, I think I even had that much storage at Google. <laughs> thanks to Google, actually. <laughs> Different questions. So, up in scale, rice clays, ice clays, neutron clays. Mm -hmm. So the surface of neutron mm -hmm. or neutrons. But there you've got to do your experiments but that, that will cost more than five dollars <laughs> <laughs> I, I just didn't get the, the data from the books so we're getting the, but but again um your patterns just wondering whether um, at, at scale so terrestrial scales earthquakes also but but star clear planetary quakes and then yeah. the neutron star quakes maybe. but it, it's yeah so you can join the rice crispy community <laughs> we welcome you <laughs> <laughs> that's a very nice offer should <laughs> <laughs> i get a stipend a bowl of rice crispy <laughs> i'm a music you have to choose whether it's the wet or the dry I mean, they don't talk to each other <laughs> <laughs> one side of my mouth is wet <laughs> But, but I am, I, I'd be happy to. And then the serious question was did, is the data on you know, time sequences of quakes like neutron star? I, I heard of them, but I don't I, know of anything other than I that. Know. I know about other things like Antarctica. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Good question. Your experiments that was. A regime of intermediate speeds where you had this nice instability when you went too fast, when you went too slow, it's different. Yeah. It was different. I didn't quite understand, probably didn't listen well how this comes out of the model. Yeah, it's the typical times. It's all about those three different times that you view. So you have elastic time for the elastic um, propagation. And you have the breakage time, how long it takes, and uh, to, to, to basically re break in the model again at spring because it goes through recurrent breakage. And then you have a viscosity time, which is the damping of, the, of your mass, right? And so when you break, it's about the time that it takes to the, the oscillations to be damped from the elastic, el elastic release. And that, that, that basically is a recovery of the. Um, of the pack after an event, so I go back to the propagation speed. But if you go very slowly, if you go quasi statically, why wouldn't you have the you get the erratic? You just you just have so long time to to reorganize yeah. that you just re resettle. And um, I don't know if I explain that. Um, but if you've I naively thought if you've got failure somewhere, the load will go to the Neighboring zone that will trigger off uh, the quake, the rice crispy quake or whatever, and you'd have something like a band which is uh, crumbling. Apparently, it's not like this. These are constant. So the first failure will trigger off other failures in the kind of chain reaction. Sorry, I, I, I was losing myself to find the, the sites. Can you? Now, I'm just imagine if you have failure somewhere mm -hmm. that would um, if it cascade sideways. Yes. Yeah. Um, there are, like, and when it comes in. Um, well, the time is 
is more I mean, in, in this vertical direction. Mm. Um, the masses are rattling after there is a break. So you have a breakage and the mm. masses are, are rattling. Okay. And you have a certain damping. Uh, this, in this case, it's the this viscosity that you damp the motion. So imagine that it's like a pendulum, right? And there is a time when you go to the minimum energy. But if I go very, very slow, the mass will eventually go to rest. But I, but, but if they continue to load, I'm going to trigger another event. And